Daniele Comboni's time, his birthplace, the cottage and lemon garden of Tissol, where Luigi Comboni, father of Daniele, was keeper of a small lemon grove, on the high mountainside above Limoni on Lake Garda, the place of the boy's growth and his grafting, his life with a much-loved mother and father, surrounded by family and friends. This was the ground in which grew his experience of God, a place in which all his brothers and sisters had died in infancy, or at best in youth, a ground fed by sun and blood. That is this man's life, bitter and brilliant. 1879, he returns to rest in the little house in the old garden, to grow again. Back from troubled Africa, he's not yet 50, but this is nearly his life's end. He's been very ill and is filled by bittersweet memories. He's in pain, yet inwardly, love of God and people is fusing into one sharp, beautiful light. Today, the little town of Limoni on Lake Garda looks a paradise. In the 19th century, it was a town of poverty. Yet the child, Daniele Camboni, was free. Free and rich only in love. The voices of today are all around us here. His followers commenting and weighing up what Daniele was, what he left as a heritage. Was Camboni's charism, God's special gift to him, just personal to this one man long ago? Or are the hopes and plans of Daniele only now being fulfilled? Is the hope, this was the hope Comboni had to save the African with the Africans. And this is happening. The dream of Comboni is fulfilled. I saw in Comboni a person who identified himself with the people of his time. In a certain way, Comboni offered that picture of a compassionate, loving God in Christ to the people, be they in Europe as well as in Africa. But I suppose the charism of Daniel Comboni is like art, you know, fine art. It doesn't belong to, to England or to Mexico, the Mayas or the Aztec for us. It's, it's universal, you know? Well, the cross is the, the situation that the people of Uganda have been experiencing. Yeah, that is the cross. And uh, I think for Comboni, he saw that he had to undergo that to, to reach the people of Africa, to be with them, to help them, to fight with them. Yes, perhaps uh, Comboni in that sense was very much devoted and attached to the, to, the, to the centralization, you know. But at the same time, he was also equally devoted and, you know, and he was actually giving his life away. Yes, the cross, of course, the cross, because the uh, uh, Comboni says we have always to, uh, to have our eyes fixed on the cross of Jesus. Uh, for me, uh, what strikes me about Comboni that is important is I, I see him as um, someone exciting, and I often see him as someone who was passionate. And I certainly want to be a passionate person too. But I still feel I have to go beyond the figure of Comboni. There are challenges today in the mission that Comboni didn't face at all because he was a man of his time. So I feel in a way, as I said before, the inspiration. I take that. I take also his logo of uh, Africa for Africa. But, for example, there is a big challenge for me today that we are feeling that the poor also evangelize us. Yeah, he was at ease with uh, royalty when he was in Europe, but he was a camel driver with camel drivers when he had to bargain for camels uh, in the desert. And, and people who traveled with him were surprised to see that the same man who had prayed in St. Peter's Basilica, who had dined with uh, royalty, uh, was there arguing about the price of a camel uh, with the same ease, you know. 
And I think that's a great gift to be able to, um, to relate to people. I think that's one of the wonderful things about Kumboni. He has something to say to, to every culture. And I think that he, he's, still, he's still attractive to, to, he's still attractive worldwide. And that's why I say he's, he's the universal man because um, no matter out of which background you come, then he still has something to say about uh, where the church should be going in terms of how it should be living its, its missionary vocation. Living. But lemon trees are long dead in Limone, their sheltering glass houses gone, their pillars skeletons. Up above, in the curve of a view of mountains, the future is wide and even frightening. In Tissol, if you are quiet, you can sense Daniele Comboni touching our lives today. The very place in which we discover God is uh, within our human journey of full of doubts, uh, full of uncertainty in our search. And that uh, search symbolizes actually the search of God himself. And, and that he tries to reveal himself to us to establish a relationship. Uh, so I think actually that is a part of a human Christian authenticity. Being true to all that we are, the soul has inward mountains, a shine of waters. Alive in the high garden is the self-doubt, the crucifixion of being a pioneer, the sheer adventure of it. Even charism is based on what we are. Actually, what we are is already the charism, what we are. And uh, though I can accept that uh, there are, there are in, in the history of the church, church at large, not uh, only the Catholic Church, or uh, in the biblical stories, calls against w w the will of the person. Somehow, the same Against the apparent will. The, uh, yeah, open as against <laughs> the apparent will of the person. Yes. But uh, maybe in, uh, mm, let's say, a, a, a crisis which has come abruptly yes. and has changed. Uh, uh, certainly, we say, I believe that God is the partner of my journey. Oh, and, uh, and certainly that is, is present, this great potential to make of my life something which has sense for me and for, and for others. Here at Limone, we shall face up to the pain in which this man, Comboni, accepted his vocation. It caused terrible suffering for his lonely parents. In 1879, his mother was already dead more than 20 years, and yet for him, she was very much alive. A lizard scuttles. Another sound, too. Are there voices here? Does his mother question him on his pain, draw him as once she did when she taught him to speak and to listen? It's just a dream, a vision of what might have been. For this film is not a biography, but a search for Daniele's real experience, his experience shared with us alive now. We dream a little in the hot sun. Daniele Comboni is with God. We can't hear his voice, know what he thinks now but we hear the continuing voice of his family, his followers. In this lemon garden, I will be his voice, and I can only give you an interpretation of him. And in my mind, I hear her voice. Mama, Domenica, my mother. Mama, the boy Daniele's greatest influence. The mother voice of home and yearning always heard within his mind and in the garden now. Listen. You left for Verona, Daniele. You left your secure, poor, settled village. Your own, your loved ones, your people. Your own, in such shared difficulty. Your family, all managing on so little, yet so happy in the lap of mountains and in the shrine of the lake. That beautiful, poor little place, Limoni on Lake Garda. Why did you leave for strangers and loneliness and the constant press of a world's difficulty to the unknown town? 
Why, Daniele Comboni? Because of the mountains. The mountains? Over the white water? The challenge of the mountains? The blue promise? No, because they circled me. The height blocked me. A prison. A beautiful prison, then. I made you a home. A happy home. But in a sense, a prison. Little in the little lemon garden, things were different. But I had to be a man. I had to leave. To Verona. Here, Daniele was to find another parent in the remarkable Nicola Mazza, and Verona was to be an alternative home. My Verona lies beneath a passing century. It is wider and louder now there, part of a Europe almost unified. Here, he will begin work for the local poor, and then for Africa. First through Matz's institutions, then at last through his own foundations and followers. Verona's politics and its trade offered the closed-in boy widening possibilities. Matz's personality and the venerable past of Verona together widened his sense of his small self. Now he felt part of the age-long Christian mission, bringing people the presence of Christ himself. It is to be an epic love story. For me, that misty morning when we came down the river from the high ground, it was a meeting place of different loyalties, a marketplace between empires. First Roman, then barbarian, Venetian, part of French Savoy, Austrian, and then Piazza Bra milling with crowds to hear Garibaldi, contemptuous of the church, promise them Rome or death. I was stirred and angry by turns. Rome or death. The air of the coming spring crackled with violence. Rome or death. It was not the spread, the flood of resurgent Italy which excited me, but the opening world running on and in like the river Adige shooting its bridges. Africa or death. Death, I shouted on the hills. Africa or death? My death, the martyrdom of Christians, not soldiers falling by force of arms, no earthly kingdom. I was afraid when you went there. Could they look after you? Would you be lost? Afraid of faraway places. Domenica feared his reckless generosity to God as she feared the missionary spirit which had taken Jesuits as far as Japan to meet their deaths horribly alongside new converts witnessing to their faith. Yet she filled the boy with a longing to go beyond mountains and probably told him stories of the church worldwide. Was Japan mentioned in her home parish near Trent? Did she tell stories heard from the community of priests in her hometown? For Trent and the Northeast Garda were then Austrian, a crossroads for international commerce, not yet part of the new Italy. Japan's crucified martyrs. Their sacrifice fascinated Daniele as he looked across Garda and thrilled with the challenge of death. Uh, outside the chapel, we have pictures of all uh, Comboni missionaries who have been killed in Latin America and Africa. And uh, my father was visiting me there, and he said, this is very morbid, isn't it? You come out of the chapel and oh, you've got pictures of all these people have been killed, you know, doesn't it put you off? Uh, for me, no, it doesn't put me off. Because I believe if I'm committing myself, my whole life, totally to the people as a Comboni missionary, that will entail 
one day, either by being killed or by an accident or by natural causes, I'm going to die. And hopefully I'm going to die giving my whole life as a Camboni missionary. I always felt that some of us will get killed again, murdered again. But that is, uh, that is the price you pay for being with the people. If you want to avoid all risks, then you go away. And uh, it, that shows that we are for the people and with the people. I felt uh, Comboni closer to, to me and to my own experience, and vice versa, my experience closer to, to, to his. Uh, in Uganda, especially these last years, when, uh, uh, for instance, we're there, surrounded and uh, closed in, 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 our, in our mission with uh, all these people, uh, refugees, uh, flocking in because outside they were shooting like hell, and this went on for months, you know, and, and we just stayed there uh, with the people, you know, sharing. Well, you, you couldn't go out to, to, to evangelize or, or, you know, do anything, mm -hmm. but just being there with them, uh, trying to, to protect them, to, to snatch uh, some people or some girls away from the soldier who wanted to kill them or to, to take them away and so on, and succeeding sometimes. At that time, instead of being there powerless, seeing people being killed, you know, these kind of things. And uh, I, I think that uh, at that time, I seen people dying around me and so on. And uh, I, I felt uh, very much Comboni's uh, uh, presence. And I remember also uh, there are some hot uh, events and moments. I would ask myself, uh, what would Comboni do here? And that gave me courage you know, to, to stand for the people in front of soldiers. And, in, uh, and uh, so, and I, I I uh, understood more his kind of you know, cry, Africa or death, <laughs> in a way. I witnessed a special case in Africa, in Mozambique. One catechist was um, made martyr. He said, I am the political secretary in this village. Leave the other, I am responsible. He was completely innocent, he was killed in a very um, bad way, you know. And um, I am convinced he received a special strength, a special call to do that. I found out that the women, and the, the sisters, and, but the women in general, were very, very, very courageous. I saw the sisters going out, facing the soldiers, talking to them, trying to convince them not to kill, not to, to steal, and uh, hiding people and taking risks that uh, untapped energy. Uh, I have seen, the, uh, for example, uh, some of the fathers much more afraid than the women were. Woe to those who kill the prophets. Those who speak the word of God offend the profiteer, the vested interest, the corrupt. They risk martyrdom, and it happens now. So Daniele's cry from Verona echoes in the whole world. Father Ezekiel was a young Camboni missionary in Brazil. He gave his life for justice, for love, for the people, for their right to live happily. His blood-stained clothes are offered with the blood of Christ. Ezekiel and many others have lived Daniele's prayer and poured themselves out. Ezekiel was shot by the tyrants. Is this a morbid acceptance of stupid risks? Daniele's spiritual family don't think so. The pure water of the gospel is polluted by greed, ugly persecution, the refusal to let people exercise their right to grow in freedom and dignity. Africa or death, the cry in his mouth has gone wider through our still ugly world. We in the West often prefer not to hear, yet it is the cry of our family, the world's poor. But woe to you, the rich, because you already have your consolation. Woe to you who have too much, because you will come to experience hunger. Bom, eu 
I'm the deputy chief, Surui, and a friend of Ezekiel. When he was killed, I felt a great emptiness, as if a son or a brother of mine had died. I still feel this today. Someone very dear to me, someone close to my heart, was murdered here in Rondonia. A rich man killed him, and this we Indians must mourn. A plea, a vow to make the world fully human because we are fully Christian. It was in the city of Verona that this adventure in life and death began. Before many years would pass, the still young Comboni was to establish communities of missionaries here, and they would go to black Africa, Negritia, and far beyond it. The original foundation of the sisters remains, that of the fathers is gone. But we are leaping ahead of our story. Verona? It was like an eddy behind a boat, Mother. The past swirling into the present, the excitement of an opening world, an arena of the Roman Empire, where Christians might have met martyrdom, where children, then and now, dressed up in the bright, sharp days before Lent to model the Middle Ages, to have carnival before fasting, the bright and the bitter sides of God. Nicola Matza, a priest of Verona, loved children and fought for them. Some philanthropists are cold human beings. This man always kept his warmth and his interest in people just as they are. In Verona, Matza looked not only after the destitute boys and girls, but with real personal attention to needs, helped also those who otherwise would have lacked a proper chance in life. Nicola Matza was also one of the first to be sensitive to young people abroad. He trained a community of priests for Africa, and it was under his guidance that Daniele was first to go there. Under his guidance, too, that Daniele sought out slave children and ransomed them, in the years to follow, bringing some of them back to the Matza Institute for their education. You went to Don Mart, sir. I was afraid that a man alone like that could not look after boys. Priests are not practical. My old Simeon, remember that he reassured you. But I was not convinced. That it would all fall into place on God's work, God for the poor and building justice for the poor. He had made a school for poor boys, and he entered into politics to fight for the rights of the poor when the dreams of the politicians were on empires and conquests. Justice doesn't feed boys. Ah, but it does. He had seen Christ, held him in his hands, and when a saint learns to let go, he longs for them all the more, as he longs for Christ, who heard the crying of a hungry child above his own words when he was preaching, and fed the crowd, because he was real and knew ordinary need. To be real, Daniele's legacy has sprung from his own dislike for pretense, his own grasp of the real and the authentic and the down-to-earth. His followers reflect that still. I would see here in Europe, our presence here in Europe as missionary orders, would be to educate people as to not only, well, I'm sure they're very aware of this difference between the North-South, the famous North-South divide, and that we here materially are very well off compared to people who live in the so-called third world. But I would say, educate people, as in share with them the reasons, the causes, the motives for which people live in this poverty. And I, I really believe that people aren't, on a general level, people are not directly aware that the poverty of the South is caused by the affluence of the North. And the way we live our style, our life here, our style of life here, has direct relevance on the suffering of people in South America, in Africa, in Asia, 
in the third world. They understood that, uh, well, I w was coming from a different place uh, and uh, I was grown up in a different way. And although our style of life was very poor, but uh, well, they understood. What they wanted from me and from us afterward, we were a few missionaries there, was our uh, personal relationship with them and our friendship. I was spending my time with them, staying with them all the day, even without drinking and eating, because I couldn't drink their water and they knew, and they knew it. Eh? And uh, so they were say, uh, seeing that I was with them, really. And for them, this is the most uh, important uh, thing. Well, I remember one morning during the portion, so that's five, six years ago now, and I, I don't know, at two o'clock in the morning, I got up and I went to the toilet. And as I was there, I shouted out, what the hell am I doing here? Yes, there are moments. Yeah, but originally when I, as a 13 year old, yeah, be a missionary will change the world. I didn't really know what, what world uh, I was attempting to change. Uh, the major steps that I've gone through are primarily also becoming closely related in myself to Christ. Uh, to know what, exactly what I said, what this love of Christ for me is and what I'm trying to offer to other people. Yeah, there are, there are moments when I've asked myself, does God exist in such a broken world? Does God exist in such a broken society as we have here in Britain? Does God exist in the painful situations that I sometimes experience? Yes, and I think we have to go through those experiences to be able to be a witness to other people. In the Piazza del Erbe, the goods from half heard of countries abroad were in those days of ours already in the marketplace for sale. The world was widening. Don Matza saw food in it, help in it, a new hope for filling needs there in the poor streets of Verona and abroad. That's what you have done. I'm proud. Yes. You should have heard the old Simeon arguing with the politicians to get what he wanted for the people they would otherwise forget. The politics of compassion. Humilitas, he said often. Humility. Not just to deny yourself, but to stay firm on the same ground as the ordinary, the unregarded people, down to earth. Being down to earth, Daniela, you left me. That was very hard, even though I wanted it, I suppose. In the parish church, under the shouting bell which rings across the lake, I argued with God's mother. I had to let you go, even though we'd be left alone without children to help and save for us. You were still so small. I hope the ladies of Lemone never heard you complaining to the Virgin. They did not like to move. She is a mother. Yes, my priests taught me not to fear to travel, not to fear adventure, not to fear the height of God. So many secret days together. The child sees everything so closely his minute gaze which singles out and stores things too small for comment. But I did not see that I was teaching myself to lose you. Papa was so horrified. He had so resigned to God. He had so needed an heir. His prayer seemed to have rotted on his tree. So much pain and in acceptance so much support in the unknown land. Papa at home and with me, I have let him go and he has me. And so we have each other constantly, we three. Through the gates of Verona from Garda, I left you to be what you wanted me to be, to get and share the freedom you longed for and, and to be 
a father, a mother, a parent to my child, Negritzia. I think we are just a, a drop in, in an ocean and uh, our actions and our activities are somehow very poor and limited. But it is important to, to, to be there as a sign and to encourage the people and also the, the, to influence somehow the, the, the politics in those countries to, to be uh, centered on the human person and not just on business, on money. Without a personal testimony, uh, we, we are practically nothing, and uh, we, we cannot influence, and we cannot say that our ideas are better or more founded than others if we do not live out what we, what we say. And even if, if we have very little you know, means and money, it doesn't really matter. Important, the important thing is to involve the people, to work with them, to, to operate, to change little by little their own mentality and to support their initiatives without uh, bringing you know, uh, the solutions of, the, of, the, of their problems from afar and imposing on them. We, uh, we hear a lot of talk in the church about uh, enculturation these days. There is a lot of talk, but uh, at the same time, in the present day in the church, there is a great deal of centralization, uh, which goes against the um, professed word that we should uh, enculturate. So there is tension. But I think that basically we are called to, uh, to be this mosaic with many different you know, shades and colors and shapes. We have a lot to learn from, uh, from young churches. Uh, I'm afraid that this is not uh, quite the, the stand. <laughs> uh, no, uh, and that's why I say uh, our presence here in Europe, also, also as company missionaries, is not just to, for us to, to send out people uh, over there, or money, or whatever, uh, but also to, to help the, the universal church to grow uh, deeper in this awareness that uh, we are all one uh, people, and indeed, in, in God's eyes, uh, and through baptism, we are all his children, and we've got to learn from each other, definitely. I would, um, I would kind of put this twist on it. You know, I think that uh, all of us, when we went to the missions, we went there with the idea of trying to make meaningful to tr the gospel to the people. We tried to enculturate it. And I think that's where some of our freshness comes from. In trying to enculturate the Gospels, I think we also were able to encounter the Lord that has already preceded us there. Yes. And I think that uh, in our own countries, in uh, Europe and uh, in the Americas, I think that we need to look again at that question. How, how can the Gospel be enculturated? Because I think that for too long, we haven't asked that question here amongst ourselves in, uh, in, in Europe and in Africa. How is the gospel meaningful to us? And I think it, it's in looking at that question that freshness comes. In Latin America, there is a kind of answer to that uh, question, uh, which is called uh, basic Christian communities. It's, uh, it's a different kind of experience, which came not uh, from the top of the church, or the priests or bishops, but from the people. People who, the Christian, people who live uh, their faith in, in a context of uh, their history. Because uh, uh, the faith is lived in a human history. It's not, uh, we can't uh, separate in Latin America our aspect of faith and politics or, or our daily life. We are very much touched. It's for us, it's some kind of a unity.
The lemon garden is hemmed in by a sea of olives. The whole lakeshore is grey with the olive trees. The children of Limoni, lake children, must have loved the story of Noah's Ark. On the great flood, it came to rest across the mountains in far Ararat. And in that foreign place, they found themselves at home in a welcome of olives. The dove had showed them dry land and safety, returning before they could see land with an olive twig. God's love, the good dove, Holy Spirit. To find that strange home in what we are meant to be, we each need to set out, find God in humankind. This is mission, and its ways are not at all obvious, but learnt with care and pain. We have to approach other people on their own terms. Christ comes to them in their own way, but that way has to be real, authentic, without pretense. This surely involves us first in learning more about ourselves and the way God acts on each of us. Europeans surely need to learn better how local in particular is their own small view of Christianity, how wide is the will of God. We need to be properly encultured, to see our European limitations and our strengths. Then we shall know how much we have to learn. Daniele Comboni, exultant on the White Nile in the excitement of youth, could not know that God's will for him was not the simple matter he imagined. The White Nile is so wide that it looks more like a lake than a river. The vegetation on both banks is very picturesque. Herds of monkeys run to the river to drink and move away, jumping up and down the trees, playing like mischievous youngsters. Hundreds of antelopes and gazelles are grazing undisturbed. Never a shot has broken the silence of their green Eden. Huge crocodiles are lying lazily on some sandy isles. Enormous hippos are puffing in the water, and their sinister bellowing in the evening makes our blood curl. But we are used to it now, and everything leads our thoughts to God. How immense and powerful he must be. 1857, sent out by Nikola Matza, he was the youngest in an expeditionary team from the Matza Institute. He was as irrepressible as a child as he went down past Cairo, down the Nile, on the ship the Morning Star, to fulfill at last the ambition and the love which had filled his boyhood. He is still only 26, and the challenge is all ahead. As he comes to his Negritzia, we must understand what is going on inwardly. Leaving the parents and Garda was then and remained a matter of peak importance and peak pain. Yet their sorrow over me is the greatest sacrifice that providence of God has placed upon me. And he wrote to his father. On those occasions when, armed with only my cross, I face a crowd of naked men armed with spears, bows and arrows and begin to speak to them of God, I realize just how alone I am. Although I am not in Europe with you, you are somehow present to me, and I seem to see you on your knees, begging the good God to crown my labors and worries with an abundant harvest. So now you see how we are always united in our hearts, although thousands of miles separate us physically. Yet in fact there is to be a strange and terrible turn in events. This first joyous experience of Africa will last less than two years until it is cut short. And for the moment, Daniele Comboni feels a drift on a far wider sea than he crossed to go into Africa. A drift, an arc on the great sea, the fear of shipwreck. Choice is bitter. Choice is lemon, is bitter. Suddenly, disaster follows disaster.
His lifelong desire to preach the gospel southwards into the countries of the equatorial lakes will always be cruelly denied him. Going back north, he lay exhausted with fever down in the bottom of the boat and was sent under obedience, weeping and protesting, back to Europe. The horror for him was immeasurable. What he had most feared now seemed to have happened. He had lost twice over. His parents were bound to suffer without his support and labor in the lemon garden, but they accepted that. Now, lonely and exhausted by childbearing and so much loss, his mother has died. But worse, the reason for the parent's sacrifice now seems nullified. It seems that he will not have the health and strength to work with the African people after all. He is back in Europe. Had his mother died in vain, he must have asked himself. But Domenica is not to have died so early for nothing. From the Matza Institute, he will in the years up to 1864 do invaluable work on behalf of slaves, learning about the education of Africans in Europe, beginning the traveling as roving ambassador for Africa, which will be his true life's attainment. Even once pinning Pope Pius IX back against the wall in his enthusiasm to have his support for Negritia. The amused Pope became a lifelong friend of this enthusiastic 29-year-old, an admirer of his grit and dedication. Prayer in practice, prayer embodied. But darkness continues until at last in Rome, in 1864, at the tomb of the fisherman, the man of the lake, Peter of Galilee, he is ready for fertility, the olive. Fidel Gonzalez, one of Camboni's foremost biographers. Well, he says, I didn't know what to do. I could not see any light at all and I was praying hard because I wanted to see the light, the solution, and I could see nothing. And uh, at this moment, he was in St. Peter in Rome, praying in front of the, of the grave of St. Peter. In that moment, he says that he felt like a curtain that is, it is open. He sees a new light, a, a, new, a new wisdom to understand this situation. And this is for me a gift of the Spirit, because at that moment he has, first of all, the capability of looking at things in a different way, of understanding how history in Africa is going, and also the strength, like a prophet, to stand for this in front of everyone. And immediately, immediately after this deep experience in St. Peter, it was a on the 15th of September, uh, 1864, he goes directly to the, the Cardinal of Propaganda Fide. Propaganda Fide was the, 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 is the body in charge of the, of the missions in the Catholic Church. And he is going there to this, to this man, Cardinal Barnabo was the name of this man, to propose a plan, his famous plan for the salvation of Africa through Africa. He, he uses also a, mm, a typical word that uh, is also expressing his own mentality. The regeneration of Africa through the Africans themselves. So the Africans, be, they become builders of their own history. And they become subjects, not objects, of this history of salvation. First of all, and after, immediately, he goes even to the Pope of that time, was Pius IX, and he start going around through Europe. Uh, here in Italy, the north of Italy, France, England, he goes also to London. And after he comes back from Paris, he prepared also a memorandum together with uh, uh, Bishop Messiah, the future Cardinal Messiah, the famous apostle of Ethiopia, against the slavery, you see. So unexpected the way of God always. This amazing young man in his early 30s moved the heart of the decision makers of the then world. Our world habitually dismisses the young idealist. This youngster was right.
was proved right by history. I think it would be a church where um, people feel at ease, where there is a sense of community, um, uh, a church that is um, that feels that there is a value in what uh, they believe in, in what they are doing. These people have been educated to just to obey, to bow their heads down before priests, before bishops. So what we need now is a complete new education of people. So all that is going on, for example, in Eastern Europe now, people are realizing that they are free, they have their rights. That's not going, uh, it's going on in the church, but we are still behind, I think, society. The priest is not at the center of the parish. It should be the people taking over as well many of the responsibilities of the parish. Otherwise, we are wasting our time, and this is not what the church is about. And especially, I think, in Europe, our role in, in, in Europe is to, to say something about these situations, and many times, uh, we don't see anything, especially the, the normal mass media. Only some news we, we, we receive. And uh, I think the role of the missionaries in Europe is to, to say what the normal mass media are not saying, especially regarding problems in the south of the world, Latin America and uh, Africa especially. We realize that in fact the aid that the people that comes out from the tax money of Italian people was going to support dictators in third world countries under the, the disguise of uh, being uh, uh, an aid for promotion and for uh, better conditions of life in, in those countries. So that really infuriated more than one politician in Italy that uh, eventually went to the, to the Vatican and the Vatican made pressure on, the, on our society, on our congregation to uh, put uh, to, 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 make us, uh, to make us be silent. Controversial in its time, Daniele Camboni's plan for Africa proposed... ...to entrust native priests or catechists of proven suitability with the permanent direction of the missions and Christian communities of the interior, once they have been founded and set in motion by the European missionaries. In order to develop the gifts of the most able members of the indigenous clergy and to train them as able and enlightened leaders of the Christian communities of the interior of Africa, the association in charge of directing the new plan will, as its great work progresses, found four great African theological scientific universities at the most important points in Africa. Later, he will win support for these ideas at Vatican I. But he was speaking in Vatican II terms before Vatican I had even happened. Experience has clearly shown that European missionaries cannot do the work of redemption in those burning regions of the African interior because the conditions are ruinous for their health and also that they cannot bear the weight of the exertions, the multiplicity of the discomforts or the harshness of the climate. In the same way, experience has shown that in Europe, Africans cannot receive a complete Catholic education. This is because either they cannot live in Europe, or by the time they return to Africa, they have become unsuitable for that continent because of the European habits, which have become almost second nature to them, habits which become repugnant and harmful in the conditions of African life. This is what we call enculturation. He plans training for black people so that they can themselves build a better standard of life and improve their own agriculture. At his time, explorers and politicians thought that Africans were savages, fit only to be exploited. But Comboni already contemplates their university education. All the men will be instructed in the practice of agriculture and in one or more skills of first importance and every woman will be similarly educated in the most necessary of women's skills. Craftsmen to whom will be given a practical knowledge of the necessary skills most useful in the central regions to make them into virtuous and capable farmers, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, 
At the mission station of Malbez, he even set up an experimental training community. He felt the need, the importance of, the, of women in evangelization. For me, it is a great sign of hope. And I feel that even though the structure of the church or the structure of the society of the Comboni Fathers of another kind of congregation, they don't recognize or they don't appreciate the value and the importance of our presence in evangelization. And he also saw the sisters in uh, in an equal way to the to the fathers in in work and in in formation and in every part. Just it, w it was impossible to realize all these things. Uh, women feel hurt because they feel as if they're not appreciated. They feel as if they're not being given the opportunities to express themselves in the way that they would like to, to give as much as, as they feel that they could give. And on the other hand, my experience is that men feel threatened by the fact that women want more space. Um, so I don't think there's a fuss. I think there's a need to, to, to clarify, um, to clarify roles, to, to see our roles more as complementary rather than competitive. Daniele did not return to Nigrizia until he was in his 40s. Indeed, he was only able to live seven years actually in the Sudan, including three years as pro-vicar and a brief total two years later on as Bishop of Central Africa. Yet his whole life's activity is far, far more important than this. His potential would not be fulfilled in Africa, but for Africa. His love song for young Negritia would be sung for the most part in old Europe, his life a sacrifice of prayer. No doubt to the young man of 1857, all the struggles to come, negotiations, difficult journeys, disagreements, meetings with the great and the good, the politicians and the royal families, would have all seemed very much a second best. It was his love, Negritia, he wanted. But largely deprived of that joy, his longing identified him totally with the suffering of black Africa. Of that prosperity which will raise the black peoples from their abject poverty and powerlessness to the condition... His years in Europe as Central Africa's spokesman and advocate are our lasting heritage. The role of the church and the role of Christianity, well, I would say the role of the church in this moment, the, concretely the Catholic Church, has been very prominent because, in fact, in some of these countries where there was a change into democratic rule and there was a national assembly, uh, the president of the assembly was a bishop. That happened, for example, in Benin, that happened in Gabon, that happened in Zaire, even if things didn't uh, go very well, but. Uh, the bishops were invited to preside on the National Assembly. Uh, so I think the church is, um, is uh, one of the institutions which is uh, credible now in Africa because uh, more or less with some fears and perhaps a little bit late, that is true. But bishops ha have been a steady voice uh, asking for human rights, for respect of the, person of the persons we can see that Camboni's heritage is now being fulfilled through other people, doing now what he planned for but could not do himself. His plan, his influence as roving ambassador for black Africa, has blended with the work of other great men to alter our history and make world democracy. Yet to him, his personal work in Africa almost seemed to have failed. How we must beware our own part in the will of God may be literally beyond our horizon. We are called and saved together. Daniele Comboni was unstoppable, dominant. Of course he aroused jealousy, and his last years after the death of Pius IX were particularly scarred by cruel incidents of opposition and resentment, even in Verona itself. This tormented him. 
Worse still, when he was bishop, famine, disease, terrible weather slaughtered his people and killed or weakened so many missionaries that he was left alone in Khartoum. When he died in 1881, a terrible war in Sudan was beginning. It wiped out all his foundations. Yet in Verona, before he last returned to Africa, he preached of thankfulness. In the Basilica of St. Zeno, Verona's roving fisherman saint, and Zeno had been a black African of the fourth century. It was from this beloved Verona of ours that there went out the mighty flame of that sacred fire destined to throw light on those unbelieving nations. Mission, as we see it nowadays, and I think Comboni saw it already a hundred years ago, um, is a two-way street. We do bring a gift of a certain organization that helps to get things done. We might have to be inspired by someone who gives us the, the gift of celebration, not to be so um, always um, intense and um, so purposeful in everything. Sometimes it's just good enough to celebrate life. Africa to Verona, grant that this most holy faith may return to Africa as the undying fountain of redemption and life. As a child, I once slipped down, down into this pool at the waterfall's foot, down from the height above. I had not before been so wet and cold, so shocked and glad to be alive. But since so many times, so many times. Yes, those times of falling, and pain and cold have become a link to all those who are cold and without shelter. They are the cross which links, which embraces in its arms us all as we are. But now I make my cross from the olive branch of home as the dove, God's own good spirit, brought the olive branch to show that the ark was home. Dying, I fling my olive cross out down in the water, and I hurl myself, my own soul with it, confidently out into the Holy Spirit. He flies free before us, falling and suffering and accepting and pouring out with Christ. It was in black Africa that I first met rites of initiation. 
Ah, yes, we Europeans have our own, and sometimes cruel, transitions from childhood to adulthood, from one state of life to another. But nothing prepared me for the sheer savagery of this. In black Africa, Negritia, death is present everywhere. No child can depend on growing up. Every child faces the certainty of terrible suffering. And to prepare them to face pain with resignation, this. And as in the face of plague and slaughter, they must not cry, must not complain. We call ourselves Christians, Daniele, but we do not prepare ourselves for Christianity. We cannot, do not face the reality of the cross. The cross is shame on us and the peace it should make in us. Friends, in my day and equally in yours, who knows more in yours? For did your people not allow Hitler and Stalin and atomic war? Do you not still allow most of the world to die while you make profit? In my day, and equally in yours, we white peoples, we civilized people, waste all our energy being cruel and insensitive to one another, leaving people lonely and not supporting them. And for what? Where is Christian democracy, Christian civilization? Is it just for Europe? Jesus was not a white man. to the cross. It was in the midst of troubles and thorns that the work of our redemption was born and grew. Its development is wonderful and its future is surely consoling and happy. From the cross there issues great power because the Nazarene raised up on the tree of the cross stretched out one arm to the east and the other to the west. It was on these ruins that he raised up the cross, worker of marvels, which attracted all things to himself. This is my blood, which is poured out for you and for everyone. The cross. So Daniele Comboni found the secret of his own soul by giving it away to the beloved strangers of Negritia in their terrible bondage and pain. Christ became a slave, made himself one with the powerless, to be totally with them in love, one of them. Yet even disaster can be transformed by the cross's mystery. Missionaries today are sometimes disabled from their work by illness. I come to, to thank, to be grateful to this uh, the illness, to the disease, because in maybe it's the only way I can share with the situation in which my people are living there. I mean, uh, you know, I have, uh, whether you like it or not, uh, it, we cannot share completely their way of life. Uh, if I were to eat what they eat and the way they eat, I wouldn't last uh, two months there in Africa. But uh, sickness, disease, I think is the, 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 the only thing which can really put us uh, uh, to be the same way that they are. They are impotent when they are sick, and I share with them the same feeling of impotence. One aspect of Comboni's life, one only, was his work for those who had been seized in Africa from their families and villages 
into slavery. Comboni had a decisive role in turning opinion and action against the slave traders, not only when he was in the Sudan, but in many trips abroad undertaken for this purpose and in his growing influence on church leaders and governmental authorities. General Gordon and the Islamic authorities recognized that he was a power in the land, and on the basis of his reports, they later acted firmly to free slaves and stop the trade. Daniele himself collected huge sums to buy individual slaves back. Even, you see, at the time of Comboni, one bishop uh, from the United States, the Bishop of Savannah, uh, 19, 19, uh, uh, sorry, 1870 exactly, he was asking from the fathers of the Vatican Council to make a statement that the black people were fully human. Because many people, he said at that time, the council, in the States, even preachers, were denying that. Okay? So this was a common mentality in many people of that period. Uh, how it is that Comboni not only, not only is able to overcome this mentality, but to look at the African race, at the black uh, people, in a completely way, uh, in a completely different way, up to the point that uh, he uh, is able to write and to, and to work for their promotion and also to give them, at that time, against the background of this mentality, great responsibilities and great capabilities of self-governing, for instance, and also, uh, you see, he wants that the African people, they ha must have in their hands, they must become builders of their own history. Africa and the poor Africans have taken possession of me, and I live for them alone. I cannot find words to describe the deep sorrow of my heart or the intensity with which there weighs on me the thought of the desolation and weariness in which they drown. The cross, the true and universal Eucharist. From the time of the plan for Africa onwards, the cross came to stand at the very center of all he thought, all he hoped. The first Christians realized that Jesus Christ was one with God. Suddenly, they saw that he was more entirely one with humankind than anyone who'd ever lived. That was because he had entered into human bondage, not just into humanity, but into powerless humanity, slave humanity. And he bought us all back from death by giving himself for us. Christ's unity with everyone became the way of unity for them all, unity in God. That final unity, a mystical marriage with Christ, is offered to us all by the way of service and pain. I had to remind them that I was only Daniele Comboni, a local man, one of their own when they cheered and sang at the church's consecration ten days ago down in the village. For me, it was a meeting with myself, my past and my future. I was full of joy, but inside, trembling with fever and apprehension. The next day, after saying Mass, you, you collapsed. I thought you were going to die then and there of the plague. Even after all those terrible, nauseous arsenic baths you took to kill it. Mama. So after the raging fever and the great disheartenment he felt, the fear of dying in Europe, not in Africa, 
Daniele rested in the lemon garden, and there, dreaming and in prayer, he at last confronted the dark love of God through unity with poor, poor Africa, bleeding from all its pores. I think that was, in a certain way, his garden of Gethsemane. He, Comboni could be, uh, could, could have been, uh, you see, in Europe, uh, a man of power. He was a very intelligent man, had a lot of relationships and friends, and this, but this temptation, he was so taken by the Holy Spirit, it was for him easy to overcome these temptations. But the most difficult temptation of Comboni comes precisely in this moment. You say limone. I would say limone, but not only limone, several times after that. In which uh, he looking back said, what is the use of all my life, of my, all the my sacrifices for Africa, difficulties, famine, missionaries, failures, misunderstandings, opposition, my plans are not anymore followed by many, especially because they are following. There was, at this moment, in Africa is already almost under the, the plans for a division among the colonial powers. So like Christ's temptations in the desert and the final trial and tempting at his death. Now, from here, the prayer starts because it's... I think Moses has done the same experience sometime when he said, no, this people belongs to you, then you look after him. I do my best, I do what I can, but then remember, this is your people, not mine, all right? I used to come back at 7 o'clock in the evening, so it was a full day. A full day full of uh, listening to stories, eh? uh, listening to problems, sometimes problems that could not be solved. They just want to be listened to. Some days we had despair too, because the despair was so great around us. Eh? And, the, and then what? You throw it, I used to throw it into God's hands at night, because it was too heavy for me. You know, the burden is too heavy for me. Too many people come to us. Too many people want us to solve their problems. It's too much. And at night, uh, we, uh, we are tired and they say, well, you know, Leave it in God's hands. Tomorrow will be another day. And now, Daniele must take on Christ's death as his own. Death is in you. Before I know for sure that all this work will be passed on, that others will love the Africans as I have loved them. God is alive. We'll always love them. Trust, child, in dark blood. It is the pain of bearing you all over again. Some things need pain to make us worthy of relieving pain. Perhaps uh, she put all her hope, all her trust uh, in this boy. Probably uh, he was the summary, the resume, the, the essence of her motherhood. She might have thought, you know, I have lost all these children and God has left me with this one. Perhaps he's going to be something great. At least every mother dreams of her children being great. And the fact that she encouraged him and was ready to give up the affection of this child, sending him to Verona to study and then to let him go, really free to Africa, I think it is heroic uh, in a sense that this mother is so self-forgetting. She is concerned only um, for the happiness and the realization of her child. But I think that deep down she must have, an, uh, must have had an awareness that all the children, all the Africans, that Daniele would call his sons and daughters. They were in some way her sons, her daughters. So in a sense, uh, her motherhood was multiplied by thousands. I, I feel that she played uh, a very, a very strong role in this. That uh, I, I don't know, but as a sister, 
uh, certainly I have never felt barren. I, I feel that my, mo my motherhood is much more realized than that of my sisters with a child of two or two. Uh, I, I, I cannot see that the physical um, motherhood is greater than the, the giving birth uh, to a, the life. Of course, being in Limone, the place of his birth, uh, looking at his father, at his mother, at the garden, at everything, but it was a question of just like a, like a, a lightning of a few seconds, let me say, uh, in the sense of, not in the, say, uh, the, the chronological measure of the time, but just, but he says, but I realize that the important thing was not myself, but the important thing is that the work of the Lord goes on. Mysteriously, I don't know how. Maybe through my own retirement and death. And so he renews once again his commitment, his commitment with Africa. That uh, kind of uh, mystical marriage with the, with, the, with the African people, linked with Africa through the mystery of Christ. He renews in that moment. And he writes this, especially in a certain, at a certain moment, he writes to the cardinal of propaganda. He says, please, if my retirement, my humiliation, would be the source of a new life for the African people and a better plan, please, don't mind to put me aside. His life's Eucharist. Life and death offered now together in a sad psalm of thankfulness. Bread and wine. Thy will be done, Father. Listen, this struggle can't be imprisoned in mere history. It contains the deepest substance of us all and for us all. The life blood. Life blood like losing all those children of our little family. And this son tearing himself away, away into the dark places, the unknown countries. All prayer is risk. Real life is risk. Yes, and now not passive, but handing yourself over to pain for a prayer, an offering for others. Seeing them go real before God. Oh, my son, my dear child of blood, your prayer is your own death. In blindness and pain, if... if... I see those well-loved faces weeping, calling, helpless. I say their names even at the greatest height of my own ills and hurts. I love them. He puts love in us all to expend. My child, at last you are being mother and father to millions. Mother, they are real as loved as if they were my own flesh and blood, my own children. Let me go. Oh, let go. I kiss you across time. You are going. Once you feared that I would die when I was lying asleep, weak from loss of blood, loss of children, and you could not let me go. There was no one to ask. Your papa was up in the garden. Not to know, not to be powerful. All my life's investment in one throw, the risk of the cross, while some cast lots for his garments and call me a fool, a wasted life. I do not know why. Or see the sense of all this loss. 
I do know this, that nothing worthwhile for the Christian is ever done without much suffering. I know that. No comforting explanation, no final reassurance, but only this bare fact. Pain has proved fruitful, and time and again, in the eyes of those who are tended with love, at death I have seen love's serenity beyond explanations. I could not hold on to life, though I needed so much to see the future, your future. And I died when you were first away down the Nile, gone from me to your children. So I knew my dying would cause you torment. Once, when you were very little, your father left a lemon on the tree. It had been blighted, you see, and it was bitter. Somehow you got it. You ran to me with that bitter lemon. Give it to me now, my Daniele. Not as a child, unknowing, but adult, deliberate, with pain. Some of the best gifts are bitter, hard to receive, and only with the pain of giving birth. Go back, child. Accept your past, our past, Africa's past. Even though you know you cannot complete it all in joy and triumph, you see darkness, the pain you've had, and the pain you have caused weighs bitter. Accept yourself, Daniele, your failings, your weakness, as a special achievement of a truly strong man, grown up before God. I still come back to the word compassion, and I think that my my hope for us as a Comboni family is to be able to to live that vision of Comboni with a great compassion in the perspective that he lived it, looking at the, the cross and seeing a, a God of love, a God of love for the whole of humanity and a God of love who calls us to to bring to birth that same love for the whole of humanity to stand by the cross, to stand by the people who are crucified today, to stand by the people who have no voice, who suffer. And I, this is our role. This, uh, this was the role of Mary. This was the role of Comboni's mother, to, to stand by these people. That's where life is at for me. Um, it's a uh, it, it's a process of, of becoming more real, becoming more true, becoming more alive through the experience of assuming that sort of death. The very presence is, is giving hope. It's, uh, it's telling uh, the person who suffers, look, uh, you are loved. Uh, it makes a difference to die unloved than to die loved. Not that it takes away the suffering, it's impossible. To, uh, there is no life without crosses, and Marie said. Uh, uh, really, the suffering is like giving birth to life. That is what it is. But today, we try to shelter very much uh, the people, the children, from suffering. We, I see, they give them everything in order to shelter them, uh, to prevent them, to, you should not talk about death, you should not make life hard for them and so on. And when they face life, uh, they are at a loss, many of them. Uh, I think we are depriving them of life sometimes. 
not as a child, unknowing, but adult, deliberate, with pain. The gift of your weakness, because it is the best gift to him. Love. Love, as a spreading lake of love beyond strength and sentiment. The best, the very best. A cross in the waters. I had to go to those who seemed so strange, nothing in common, so unlovable, until their faces shone for me, more real than dreams and ideals, and the accident of one man's destiny. Negritia, my own people, were my own profoundest self, and to find Negritia, I have come back here to retrieve my whole life, my home. Daniele went back, though it took him a year of illness and agony to get there. At Khartoum and South, there was chaos, death, and disagreements with those who were supposed to support him. He died exactly two years after the lemon garden from the fever already in him but mystically happy in his failure. His bones were scattered when Gordon was overthrown. But after a few years, the Comboni family began to take up what they need to learn from him. Re-established, the mission continues today in the self-same realism. After that moment of acceptance in 1879, I wrote this. The future of the mission is sure but it will be accomplished only in the sign of the cross. <laughs>